Hello Aviators, Sky here, and today we are going back to Russia. We've seen enough of different American and European planes, ordinary and unusual, and I think it's time to return to the cozy embrace of good old veterans. And what could be older and better than the grandfather of aviation and the master of the Soviet sky, the Tu-154 airliner. To begin with, let's look at our today's aircraft, or, well, not quite an aircraft. Its history begins in 1993 with the Tu-154 airliner with the tail number RA-85770. For a decade and a half, the plane actively flew in the fleets of several airlines, but at the end of the 2010s it retired. Times are changing, the Tu-154, no matter how accomplished it was, could no longer compete with new generations. In 2018, its adventures in the sky ended, the airliner stood in storage for several years and was disposed of. A logical question arises. Sky, aren't you talking about a flight simulator? What does the real Tu-154M have to do with it? The answer is, I am talking about a simulator. We're going to the recently opened Legend Aero Flight Training Center, where an important part of our former hero stands. Just when the plane stopped flying and went into retirement, while the owners were thinking what to do with it next, the fathers of the current Legend Aero started thinking about an airplane simulator. Despite the fact that the plane was scrapped, they managed to snatch the nose section along with the cockpit, or what was left of it, deliver it to Moscow and start creating their simulator here. Yes, this is not a dynamic platform with an imitation of an aircraft cockpit, but a real cockpit on a dynamic platform. So, here we have a giant hemisphere with a cockpit of the Tu-154 inside. This hut on chicken legs the size of a small house weighs about 5 tons, over 11,000 pounds, so the characteristics of these legs had to be appropriate. The platform drives are electromechanical, not hydraulic. As practice has shown, not only here but also on, let's say, big and serious full-flight simulators on which professional pilots are trained, electromechanics turns out to be more effective, reliable and easy to maintain. The platform was built by local engineers. The initial idea to buy a ready-made platform and put a cockpit on it was not realized. There are no local manufacturers, and the purchase from foreign suppliers, given their ambitions for performance, was accompanied by such a price tag that… Well, if you want to do it right, do it yourself. The Tu-154 cockpit is a symbol of the aviation of its time. A large and complex structure filled with all kinds of mechanisms and indicators, the number of which has to be handled by a crew of four people. The commander, co-pilot, navigator and flight engineer. Just looking at the workplace of the flight engineer is enough to feel the progress. Nowadays this whole instrument exhibition is hidden behind a set of electronic functions, a couple of buttons and a display. This is especially interesting for real pilots of modern commercial airliners, especially new ones, to see what it was like to fly on such veterans and to feel with their hands many of the functions that are now embedded in the program codes of onboard computers. But no drama. Considering that veterans are the direct ancestors of modern machines, the general design and structure of the cockpit are similar, so there are no situations where the pilots are spinning in their seats, trying to understand what are those huge things sticking out of the floor. At most, they'll need to look around and find some devices, with questions from the category, how were you able to manage all of this? The biggest problem apparently was the fact that the Tu-154 is a plane from the 1970s, analog, it has no computer controls which could be imitated by the equipment in the hull. The originality of the systems is also added. One of the differences from the usual simulators that are used for riding aviation enthusiasts is that here we find ourselves in fact in a real cockpit, the filling of which once actually controlled a real plane. This is even noticeable visually, many of the elements look aged and shabby. And each device needs to work, work the way it used to on a real plane and feel the way it felt on a real plane. And there are countless devices here. Here I must make a note about the analog nature of the Tu-154. This aircraft of course is a veteran, it was created a long time ago, but after all it is not the An-2. You should not think that its control sits solely on cables and rods. 
Unlike Ilyushin, who was trying to make his plane simpler, Dupolev on his airliner introduced probably all the latest solutions that were available at that time. The pinnacle of these solutions is probably the automatic onboard control system, which can be considered one of the progenitors of modern aircraft automation. It first appeared on the Tu-134 and with each next aircraft was becoming more advanced. It was already much smaller on the Tu-154, successfully migrated to military aircraft and its most advanced form was reborn on the Tu-160 already as a full-fledged fly-by-wire. On the Tu-154, the system is an intermediary between the pilots and the booster control of the mechanisms. And yes, it also had to be imitated on the simulator. The visualization system here is also very serious, which is hinted by the size of this ball. Inside, 2.5 meters high screen with a 220 degree view. When sitting normally in the pilot's seat, the edges are not visible, only the endless sky. The sky here is taken from the X-Plane Flight Simulator. The software is mostly self-made, considering that the Tu-154 simulators are an exotic phenomenon in our time, it makes little sense for large companies to make software for it. Alright, it's time to start preparing for flight. Since I alone would obviously not be enough to fly a 100-ton jet airliner with a crew of four, I will go on the flight with an instructor. Typically, as instructors, such simulators have simulator control masters, or more often, pilots of the plane which is being simulated. In my case, as an instructor, I have not just a Tu-154 pilot, but Andrei Lamanov, a highly experienced pilot with a huge flying time on the 154, and a man whose skills have been confirmed both on usual flights and on the unusual ones. In 2010, seemingly not so long ago, in the town of Izma in the north of Russia, the Tu-154M made an emergency landing. The landing was, to put it mildly, unusual. The emergency landing was made by an aircraft with a large-scale failure of the onboard systems, without navigation and communication, with a loss of power supply, disconnected fuel pumps and most of the mechanization that showed no signs of life and this 80-ton machine touched down on a long abandoned runway, which with a length of only 1300 meters, even at the best of times was not designed for such large jet aircraft. But the airliner landed, swept along the runway and went 164 meters beyond its limits, mowing down small trees. None of the nine crew members and 72 passengers were injured, in a situation in which every possibility was drawing a grisly plane crash. This incident is still considered some kind of cocktail of the incredible skill of the crew and an outright miracle. At the yokes in the cockpit were Evgeny Novoselov and Andrei Lamanov, both became heroes of Russia. And one of them is now telling me how to fly this plane. How much cooler can it get? It's like playing Kerbal Space Program with Werner von Braun. Well, enough talk, it's time to soar into the sky. Moscow Vnukovo Airport, taking off to the north directly towards the Russian capital. Flying over Moscow is an interesting matter, because in reality of course no one would have led us to fly like that. The airspace has many severe restrictions, and at low altitudes, let's say an extremely limited number of aircraft can fly here. The next landmark in Russia where we can fly is the main southern harbor, the airport of Sochi, the capital of the 2014 Winter Olympics. The place is undoubtedly beautiful, we've been there, seen a lot of interesting things, and now being on a runway in the cockpit, albeit virtually, is also interesting. 
A couple of changes in the control system of the simulator, a couple of changes in the control system of the plane, and we are in Sochi. The guys from the air traffic control will be outraged, because the airport is quite complicated, located on the plain between the Black Sea coast and the mountain range in the interior of the mainland. Meanwhile takeoffs and landings are only allowed from the seaside, and we are going towards the mountains. Big no-no. But we are after all on a simulator, and we promise to behave. Don't pout. <laughs> From these recordings, it may seem that I was just sitting in a chair, more so in the commander's chair, but firstly, this is how it's supposed to be, guests are seated on the left. And secondly, not everything is shown in a video, because piloting an airliner, even virtually, and holding the camera in parallel is just dumb. And in reality, you can get into serious trouble for it. In any case, landing in Sochi, also at sunset. Beauty. Which you did not see. <laughs> But it's okay, the third flight will already be with a landing in the frame. We say goodbye to the southern capital and return to Moscow. Flight Vnukova Domodedova. We have to show at least some movement in space according to the flight results, otherwise you get a flight to nowhere with arrival at the place of departure. So here it is, the end of the flight. Evening, Domodedova, beautiful. Such simulators, of course, are more of a topic for fans. Piloting the Tu-154 is unusual. Our simulator is not the only one in Russia. There are several more, and they are also very interesting. In general, such large simulators of vintage aircraft as a concept can be promising. Yes, modern machines such as the Boeing 737 or Airbus A320 are more widespread since the aircraft are relevant. Large manufacturers make both professional and amateur simulators like this one at the same time. On the other hand, the history of aviation knows a lot of extremely interesting aircraft, on which for obvious reasons we will no longer be able to fly. In reality, but in this format, why not? Riding on the 737 simulator is interesting, on the 154 simulator is interesting and unusual. Can you imagine what would happen if it was a 2144 or a Concorde simulator? In any case, the experience of flying in such a cockpit is very vivid and different from similar experiences in other simulators. Such was our adventure. Thanks to Legend Aero for letting us fly the airliner, we should do it again. And that concludes the story. Like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to watch the videos early, see some exclusive behind the scenes content or just support the channel, consider joining our Patreon community. Fast flights on real and simulated planes and soft landings to you. PKP, право влево и тангаж вверх вниз синенькое это небо черное это земля значит синенькое набираем черненькое снижаемся посередине горизонтально пойдут